<laughs> All right. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's begin with this, this, last, this last session. With Neil Hutton and uh, we find this invisible sentence. So okay. You only want 20 minutes, so that you have 25 minutes. 25, 25. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I say I, I'm trying to keep myself to 20 exactly. in the uh, understanding that I probably will take 25. But, yeah. okay, it's always good to start. So thank you very much, Rasmus. Thank you, Martine, she's gone, for organising this conference, and Cyrus for organising this conference as ever. It's been fantastic. It's the most inspirational day of the year for me, coming to these meetings, to be in a room full of people who are obsessed with such a tiny little area of interest and scholarship as yourself, and to have these conversations is, is, is a really great experience for me. Um, so thanks for organising this. Um, what uh, I had pla I, I should say that I left my memory stick in uh, Glasgow, and yesterday people said, well, you know, you can go and get it, download it from your computer, and we put it on a memory stick, and everything. And I thought, well, I'd listened to two or three presentations by that time, and I thought, there's a lot of stuff coming out of these presentations. I'd like to try and engage with some of these things. Um, let's forget the, the PowerPoint for once. Let's just try and do this. Command it. <laughs> so, if at, if at my stage in my career I can't take the odd risk, then there's no hope for the world. So, I don't mind making a bit of a fool of myself. Let's go for it. So, I have the presentation. I'm going to try and stick to the basic outline and I'm going to try to refer to people's work. And please, if I haven't referred to your paper, it's because my notes are a mess and I haven't really had time to think about it, so don't take it personally. So, I, I'm trying to understand how you make sense of sentencing from a sociological point of view. That's what I've been obsessed with for years. I still haven't worked out how to do this, but here is where I'm at now in trying to make sense of this, and next year it will probably be different, but here's where I'm at now. So there are three questions that I'm, I'm looking at. The first question is, what does it mean to say that sentencing is a social practice? What does social mean in these circumstances? The second question is, what can we know about sentencing? What evidence can we have about sentencing? And the third question is how are sentencing division, uh, decisions justified? And what I'm trying to do is to link those three things together. That's to say what, what, sentencing, pra, uh, what sentencing as a social phenomenon is what we can know as social scientists, and for that matter as policymakers or anybody else, about sentencing practice, what we can know, what evidence we have, and then how sentencing decisions are justified and how that justification process is connected to both of those previous things. And if you want the answer now, the end, the conclusion now, I, I see sentencing as being justified by two different methods, by process, on the one hand, and by trust on the other hand. And the, the question for analysis is how are these two modes of justification, process and trust, distributed amongst the various professionals who I argue make sentencing decisions? So that's an empirical question that you address to any uh, jurisdiction. How, are, how is justice justified by different people in, in, in the different places. And my interest in justification comes from a, a book by French sociologists, Voltansky and Thévenot, called On Justification, which I haven't read. <laughs> <laughs> I've read bits of it. It's enormously complicated, and I'm not even going to try to explain uh, the, 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 the density of this book. It was translated fairly recent, I think three or four years ago, but published in 1991. And I can't remember, I think it was reading Bruno Latour that put me in, on, on, onto it, and I haven't got quite there yet. But um, So I, in 25 minutes or 20 minutes, there's no point in going there, but it's just to note that. Um, there'll be other things which I skite over very quickly and hope you don't ask me questions on as well. So... Um, so what does it mean to say sentencing is a social practice? Um, and I suppose the argument I want to make is I see the criminal justice process as a sentencing process from beginning to end. So the police 
are involved in sentencing. It's maybe best to call it, I think as some people, maybe Cyrus mentioned this, as a penal process, right from the start. Because as soon as a police officer makes a decision, the police officer is taking an event in the world, something that happened, something that's either been seen or been reported, and is making that unique, singular event in the world, that individual action, into a class of actions. It's linking the particular and the general. And that process continues throughout. And I'm inspired by Latour's analysis, which he uses the term translation. What are we seeing here? What is the criminal justice process about? What can we get evidence of? We get evidence of documents being written and passed on to someone else who then writes another document, who passes it on to someone else, who writes another document and passes it to someone else. That's what sentencing is, ultimately. Now, we can have all the chat in the world from police officers about how they do their job, about judges about how they do their job, and blah, blah, blah. But all we, and, and all we know about what they do is what they actually produce. What is their work? What do they, well, that, that's the, 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 the evidence that we have. Um, so I, and I'm not cynical about this. I see the criminal justice process as a wonderful human creation. Not as, I'm not cynical about it at all. It's, it's, a, it's an amazingly complicated process to deliver justice through a very complicated link of agencies, each of whom have their own tasks for very good reasons. And as I was saying earlier, you know, Bureaucracy is, is an important part of, the, of, of a complex administrative state. Without bureaucracy, we would be nowhere. We wouldn't know what was going on. But what we know about what's going on is actually much more limited than, than, than we would think. And what we can know about it is also very limited. Um, so I don't see these processes being distortions of reality. There are, as Cyrus mentioned and others have mentioned, there are processes, there are people who argue that somehow... The, the, this process dehumanizes criminal justice. Well, I don't think it dehumanizes it at all. I think it's a wonderful human process of trying to deliver justice, not a dehumanization. In the, there's, there's, if, there's no unmediated, as, and again, Cyrus has written about this in his 2007 article, there's no unmediated access to what really happened in the world. There are only different ways of providing accounts of that. Uh, and so... Um, when you provide that account, you are defining, or society is constructing individuality or informality or justice in the best way it can, arguably. Well, that, 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 that's, a, that's an empirical question. Um, so, and I'm trying to get away also from the, uh, from the agency and structure uh, metaphor, which will be familiar to lots of you and Fiona's. Uh, written really interestingly about this in, in her PhD thesis. I'm trying to get away from Bourdieu's concept of habitus, which I used myself to describe sentencing. I now think that's a bit lazy. Habitus, when you say habitus, you mean what's habitus? Well, judges produce sentencing out of all the stuff that's in their head from everything they've done before and from the practices that they achieve. Well, what are those things? Uh, so habitus, it's a useful shorthand term to refer to that but actually it doesn't really tell you how those processes work. And I think what I'm interested in is understanding how these things work. And we've had a lot of really good papers in this conference already telling us in all kinds of different ways how things work. And we'll never ever know, we can never possibly collect all of the data we need to collect to know how everything works all the time. All we can ever do in sociology, in my view anyway, is have little snapshots of how some things work in some places at some time. And the more detailed and the more empirically rich and subtle these analyses are, the better. And we can then, by analogy, argue that that's how sentencing works in, in, in other places. Um, so, another... Uh, so we can never reveal the true character of sentencing. We can never fully understand how decision-making is made. Um, we, need to, we need to look at what is done, what, is, what work is done. And Susan Lee Starr has written uh, an article, the title of which escapes me for the moment, but somebody might be able to help me, um, which she has concepts of visible and invisible work. And 
when I read that, I just a big light flashed in my head, and I thought, yes, that's exactly what I've been looking for. Visible and invisible. This is really helpful. So, in sentencing, what is visible work? V- visible work are files, documents, decisions. Um, these are um, documents and, or work that is produced in order to be accountable to things like law, guidelines, practice memoranda, 70 page guidelines on how to write. Who was it was talking about that, Amy? Uh, Amy was yes. talking about 70 page guidelines on, how, on, on for, to the volunteers on how to write a thing. Uh, and, and, and lots of people have talked about this. So all of those are. Um, those are things to which people have to be accountable when they're writing a report, uh, r- uh, provide, producing uh, uh, accounts. So, I, 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 again, to borrow from Latour, these are what I would say is forms of calculabil- calculability. These are things which people can be held accountable for, visible work. So, it's a, it's a public form of accountability. On the other hand, there's invisible work. What's invisible work? Invisible work is judgment, gut feeling, intuition, evaluation, professional practices, holistic view uh, expressions of things, craft work, as Cyrus has once uh, d- 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 described it. Um, these are processes which, for which there is no formal account required. An invis- invisible work by definition, is invisible. We can't see the work. There is no account of that work. Visible work. There's there's, there's what I've done. There's my decision. Um, Who is it? Um, Stuart said, um, go and do this for me, you said. Do you remember that? He said, go and do this for me. What's this? That's this. Have you done this? Yeah, there it is. Uh, Did it work? Yes, there's there's the evaluation outcome there. That's visible work. How did you do it? Why should you care? It's here. That's all you need to know. I've done it. The invisible work is not is is, is by definition invisible. Um, so, Boltanski and Thieveno have got five different types of justification, and two of them happen to fit nicely for sentencing. I think one they call civic industrial justification, which I would call process justification, which is to say, it's formal, it's accountable, it's saying. You asked me to do this, this, and this, and here is me writing in a document that I've done this, this, and this. It's, so it's a process-oriented uh, kind of documentation. Civic industrial. Invisible. Uh, how do you justify invisible work? Well, they, they have a, a category called inspirational justification, which I think you know, Cyrus talked about judges being, as being virtuosos. So it kind of fits a little bit to that. So inspirational justification is... You don't have to provide any... You say, I was inspired to do this. How, how did, how, how, why should I take your, your, your definition of justice? Well, because I have, a, I have a direct link to God. And I just know that I've made the right decision. I, a, a caddy justice, to, to use Weber's term, sitting under the tree, saying, yes, I've pondered about this long, and I'm telling you, this is the just decision. And I'm telling that because I'm the caddy, and I'm the person who makes these sort of decisions. And you accept me because you trust me. So my, my argument is that all through sentencing, from the police to the, to, to the prison or to, to, hit, to the parole board, the thing goes right through, all professionals make invisible, do invisible work and make judgmental decisions which, for which they are not required to provide account. And all, profession, all professionals also do visible work for which they are required to, to provide an account. So all decisions are about, uh, in sentencing. Justice is uh, both inspirational and civic industrial, or process and inspirational. And when you think about it, that comes down to a very trite statement that justice is a balance between individual and con- individual individualized sensing and consistency and consistency is the is the process bit and individualized sensing is the inspiration bit so all that effort and you come back to something we all knew already in the first place but sometimes in sociology I think that's when you think maybe I'm getting it right if we all knew it and it's so obvious in the first place um, so yeah so the final the final point, which I've reached very quickly, <laughs> is 
if this analysis, if, you, if this is a, if you think this is a sensible way of looking at sense, uh, at sensing, if you think this is a helpful way of looking at sensing, of understanding sensing, um, then you look at a jurisdiction and you see to what extent do we allow police officers to make decisions about whether or not this event fits into that box or not? To what extent do we, do we allow prosecutors to make invisible work about whether they put a case into this box or that box? To what extent do we allow judges to do this box or that box? Um, uh, we, we make, and, and that, those are going to be political choices that we make. They're going to be bound by the political circumstances we find ourselves in at any given time. Uh, it's, it's not... Um, so it's a value choice. It's a, it's, a, it's a choice about whether you value uh, trust over uh, um, uh, uh, a sort of managerial type of justification. Um, but the two things are almost always going to go together in, uh, in a jurisdiction. So I then think, maybe think again about well, what does judicial discretion mean? And, and I think that actually. I went back to read Cyrus's uh, 2007 piece and, and, and reread Dworkin and thought, actually, yeah, I always thought Dworkin was talking rubbish, and now I think Dworkin was spot on because discretion is the whole. Discretion is invisible. Discretion, properly, in a, in, in a legal term, is that which you do not need to provide a formal account of, that which we will trust your judgment on, and we will not require you to provide any other kind of formal justification for it. Thank you. Questions?